All right, we're recording. So let's get this party started. Um, do you want to talk about the cocktail first? Yes. Hello and welcome to this edition of uh, Tasting. I'm sitting on a, I'm sitting on a workout ball, so I'm very short and also I'm working on my abs. So you're all welcome in advance for that. Uh, the uh, introductory cocktail. Uh, so this is Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, and opening it up with a Buffalo Trace cocktail. So uh, it's- Spoiler alert, they make a lot of different whiskey at that distillery. That's weird. Um, so we have an ounce and a half of Buffalo Trace, uh, half an ounce of cream sherry um, from Val Despino, uh, which is really cool. Uh, a little Jaffard peach, uh, Demerara simple, so that import brown sugar simple, and chocolate bitters lemon zest. It has minimal dilution, so feel free to pour over the rocks uh, or to just drink it as is. Um, you're not going to fuck it up either way. It'll taste good. It's the light one, Sierra. Yeah, the clear, the lighter of the two. So then the darker one will be uh, round two. Uh, I got a little overzealous uh, and made all of the secondary cocktails. So there's like one or two people. I just threw one in there. So you're fucking welcome, because because Chris doesn't yeah. like to count. <laughs> I can't count. I went to Shoreline, so that happened. He dropped out of Shoreline. I did. I went there to play soccer. I can't sit in this fucking. I can't sit in this. Okay, well I'll start talking. Why don't you get a grown-up okay. chair? I can't do that. All right. Now let's talk about Buffalo Trace. So we'll follow our usual format where we'll, I'll jabber on a little bit in the beginning while you all drink your cocktail, and then we'll take a deeper dive into each of these whiskeys. So as you can imagine, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of this distillery, but I'm gonna look at it through one specific angle, which is um, ownership, because there's been like a bazillion owners and a few names, and it's just, I think a really way an interesting way to look at the history of this distillery. So I'll try not to say anything compromising, uh, but there's not <laughs> there's not a lot there. It's bourbon. So let's be real. Every bourbon, like almost every whiskey, you know, they're like, this was my grandpappy's pappy's recipe and everything's got a direct lineage to 800 years ago. And you start to look into it and you're like, Okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, anyway, so there is a lot of history. It is a very old distillery. Um, and there was, I think the ownership changes kind of tell a little bit of the story of the history of bourbon in general. Buffalo Trace is obviously extremely well respected today. They've won like 10 million awards or something, I lost count. And uh, they make some really cool shit that is hard to find and expensive um, and just really cool. And so we're gonna try some of that today. Um, some of this, <laughs> I looked up some of these bottles on the secondary market, by the way, and it's like stupid. I think, yeah, thousands and thousands of dollars for one of these bottles that you are about to try. So get excited because the cost is much lower than that, but the value is extreme. Um, okay. So who owns Buffalo Trace? Well, the short answer is a company called Sazerac, but if you dig a little deeper, I've got two pages worth of story to tell you about that. Um, so the website has this awesome timeline of events, uh, which gives you a nice overview. And I read it and I was like, this is helpful. There's also like many, many, many decades missing from this timeline. Most notoriously is like the 50s to the 80s, which is just kind of a shit time for bourbon in general. So I'll get more into that later. Um, but yeah, here's so here's my best shot. Also, you can't really taste these whiskeys without hearing some of the history because they're all named after some guy, like some dead white guy in the distillery's history. So not a lot of women yet, but I'm sure they're working on that. Um, someday. someday. So in the late 18th century, uh, there was a town called Lee's Town that was established. And some guy built some sort of a structure there. Some other people started distilling there. But to tell you the truth, like everybody distilled back then. It's just what you did. Uh, but then in 1858, somebody actually built a distillery there. And in 1870, this is where the first name comes in, but this is already, you know, we've already covered like 80 years. So we're at a pretty good clip here. 
uh, but a guy named Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor, so E.H. Taylor might sound familiar to you, Jr., E.H. Taylor Jr., he bought this distillery that was built in 1858 and he named it OFC Distillery. It is not a thousand percent clear what OFC stands for, but he's known for saying that the best whiskey was made in good old fashioned wood fired copper still. So it probably means either old fashioned copper or old fired copper, but we'll just call it OFC. Um, but another hint as to like how the bourbon world's history, you're like, what? <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So stories. stories. I mean, that's what you care about, right? That's why we're here. We could tell you all the facts, the mash bills, the ABV, but that's kind of like eh, the boring stuff. Do it's you like, like the it? Bible. It's the gist. <laughs> Don't read too much in the details. It's more about the overarching moral. <laughs> um, Sorry, I went there. I went there. I apologize. <laughs> Oh boy, Chris. Okay, so Taylor had a few financial hiccups after buying the distillery. He actually declared bankruptcy in 1877. He only owned it for seven years, and yet we're tasting two whiskeys named after him tonight. So what's the deal there? In 1878, he sold the distillery to a guy named George T. Stagg, another name to note, uh, but he managed the distillery operations for a long time. He didn't actually break off until 1886, um, so like 16 years after he first took over. Um, the distillery had recently acquired another distillery called Jay Swigert, um, and he just sort of took that with him when he left, but he was out. Um, George T. Stagg was in. So by the early 1890s, um, Stagg had sold a portion of the company, and this is kind of some of the stuff you won't find on the Buffalo Trace website, like maybe because they don't care, maybe because they don't want to like tell you about how Stagg actually sold a majority of the company to just a New York businessman. Uh, but the guy, the uh, business tycoon's name was Walter B. Duffy. Um, so he sold that in the 1890s and then retired shortly after. Uh, and then in 1904, they actually changed the name of the distillery to the George T. Stagg Distillery to honor him. So we're on name number two. Throughout tonight, I'm going to do my gosh darndest to, uh, did you see me practicing not swearing there, by the way? Fucking nailed it. Um, I'm going to do my best to refer to the distillery by the name that it was at the time. So here we are, 1904. It's become George T. Stagg. Um, Stagg okay. for short. Sure. Yeah. Um, right. So here's a little juicy tidbit. Okay. So Buffalo Trace says that they are the oldest continually op operating bourbon distillery in the world. I like that ad because like, where the fuck else bourbon, are you gonna yeah. make bourbon? <laughs> so <laughs> it's all from Kentucky. I mean, it's not all from Kentucky, but it's most, all the old shit's from Kentucky. Um, so anyway, worldwide, however, there's an older distillery that is operating today, but it wasn't continuously operating. That's Burke's Distillery and they make Maker's Mark. Um, but they closed for a while during Prohibition. So Buffalo Trace's claim to fame as continuously operating is unique. However, there's rumors afloat that they did close for a while in 1917, which was before Prohibition, but during World War I. So this is unsubstantiated, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's stories. Um, so anyway, uh, the, they closed in 1917, definitely maybe. Uh, the distillery did go to auction in 1918, and a young man bought it based on his faith that it would come back. And this guy's name was Albert Bacon Blanton. He just goes by Blanton, but I feel like the middle name is important. He, however, flipped around the next year because he didn't actually want to own it. He sold it in 1919, so one year later, to one of, so Duffy owned it, auctioned it to Blanton. Bland took over and sold it to one of Duffy's, like, associates or fellow businessmen. This guy's name was Henry Nalen, um, and he didn't own it for a super long time, and he didn't own it at a great time because he, he bought it in 1919, so that's when World War One was ending. It's also, like, right before prohibition started. It's kind of a shit time to buy a distillery, uh, but he did. Um, now, 
what Blanton did in all of this is actually like super fascinating and definitely worth a deeper dive. So because we're tasting Blanton today, I'm going to go more into what he did to bring this distillery back and survive this like prohibition thing later. Um, but for now, we're going to kind of fast forward to uh, the Dark Ages, otherwise known as the 1980s, um, <laughs> when uh, Buffalo Trace was owned by a company called Shenley, Shenley Distillers Corporation. So Neyland didn't hold on to it for a super long time, then it went to Shenley Corporation. Um, so Blanton, he, uh, he guided things through for a long time, 55 years, uh, and retired in the 50s. Um, and so then after the 50s, this is the part member where I was like, there's nothing on the website about anything between the 50s and the 80s, which I get with bourbon. Um, so generally speaking, not a lot happened in that time, um, but you know, the production level kind of went like this and the demand for brown spirits in general kind of went like this. Um, in the 80s, uh, some of you might recall, everybody was like vodka. in the clubs drinking vodka with mixers that came off a soda gun. It was a very dark time for cocktails, for whiskey, for a lot of other things. Chris and I both came out of the 80s, so that was a nice one. Yeah, we're kick ass, but. <laughs> Um, but it was actually, things weren't going super well for bourbon in the decades leading up to the 80s, but by the time the early 80s came around, it was starting to look kind of bad. So one of the byproducts that you saw from this um, was that some of the distiller, independently owned distilleries were losing ownership to larger holding companies, and Buffalo Trace is no exception to that. Um, we start to see some of these really big companies, not necessarily coming out of this time, but like rapidly expanding at this time. Um, and actually, uh, Sazerac underwent a pretty big expansion at this time, but they're not like super big. They're not like Diageo big, thank God. Diageo is enormous, they own everything. Um, so, okay, so in 1983, there's a little company called Nabisco. You might have heard of them. They ain't cookies. And they decided to sell off one of their. Uh, uh, subsidiaries called Fleischmann's, like the yeast, um, but this one is called Fleischmann's Distilling. I have no idea if those two companies are related, but it kind of makes sense, like distilling and yeast. Could be. Um, they sold to a company called Grand Metropolitan. Now, Grand Metropolitan later joined up with Guinness and made Diageo, which is like this big, at least. That's pretty um, big. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so you went outside the screen. That was like past the screen. Yeah, it's like infinitely large, so far as I can tell. Like, if if Diageo ever did something super shitty and we were like, oh, we want to boycott that company, like we wouldn't, we can't they do everything. <laughs> Technically, can't. Uh, so okay, so these two guys that worked for Fleischmanns, they were the president and CEO. Their names were Ferdy Falk and Bob Baranasca. You don't have to know that; they're just great names. Just remember the alliteration. Yes. FF and BB. Um, so Nabisco sold Fleischmann's to Grand Met. Grand Met already had a huge spirits portfolio. So these guys were like, great, we're gonna get fired. So we're just gonna quit and start our own company instead, which is what they did. Um, so in 83, they formed a company called Age International, which will come up later. Um, so at first they wanted to buy the old charter brand from Shenley. Shenley member is the one that owns Buffalo Trace at the time. Stag, sorry, they owned Stag Distillery at the time. Um, they said, old charter is not for sale, but you can have the Ancient Age line, which is another brand that Stag Distillery was making at the time. But also in the deal, you can have the distillery. Uh, so they bank, you know, bourbon wasn't doing well, but they thought we can sell this stuff abroad. So they bought the distillery, they bought the Ancient Age line, and then, they started to look at Japan and they put their money bet on Japan. So they partnered with some Japanese folks. And this is when in 1984, we get Blanton's. Not much to do with Blanton himself, just named after him. Um, so Blanton came out of the eighties and it was in large part to be sold in Japan. So to this day, there are unique versions of Blanton's sold in Japan. 
Um, they also came up with a few other successful brands at the time. So they, they started doing some cool stuff. So they came out with Elmer T. Lee at the time. When they took over, Elmer T. Lee was the master distiller of Stag Distillery. Uh, but he retired shortly after. But they also came out with Rock Hill Farms and Hancock's Presidential Reserve at the time. We're not tasting those ones tonight. We tasted Elmer T. Lee in our last bourbon tasting, uh, but we <laughs> we don't have any more. So um, anyway, so in 1987, United Distillers, which became Guinness, which became Diageo, bought Shenley. Um, so you can see how this like ownership stuff. You're like this. I don't know. I think it's interesting. Um, maybe. It's You're, complicated, but it's, it's interesting. complicated, but that's why we give you alcohol. So you'll think it's interesting too. Um, so in 1989, this like bigger company was like, we're giving up on American whiskey. Like, I get it. It was a bad time. Um, so they really started to divest a lot. Um, so by 1991, Age International was not doing well financially. Um, they the distillery at its heyday had a thousand employees and by 1991 they had 50 so that's not good um they decided to sell a minority share of their company to a sake and shuzo company in japan called takara because bourbon was actually doing very well in japan um including blantons so uh this company was called takara shuzo Takara retained first right of refusal in the sale of any more stocks. So Age International by selling minority kind of like linked themselves with this company. They tried to sell in 1992 to a company called Hublain or whatever, doesn't really matter. Um, and then Takara stepped in and said, no, we'll take it. But they did it on the very last day that they had the option to because they didn't want to own an American distillery. They had tons of distilleries in Japan, but they wanted that brand Blanton's. So they bought the distillery in order to get rights to Blanton's and then sold the distillery the same day to a company called Sazerac. So Sazerac bought the distillery and they bought access to a lot of brands, but they don't own all of these brands outright because Takara still has control of, for example, Blanton's distribution in Japan. And I think there's a few others. It was actually super difficult to find information on this, uh, but it's really interesting. So I found a lot of like guys on the internet that had opinions on it, but I don't know some of those details for sure. Yeah, <laughs> usually a good sign, especially these days. Um, I have opinions too. I know. I was thinking about starting I just a to huge like dick. maybe. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. So well, I'm sorry. That was my opinion. I love him so much. I should put it on the internet. <laughs> Um, maybe, I just did. That's <laughs> right, we're recording. Okay, continue, sorry. Huh. I'm distracting. Yeah, I lost my spot. Give me a second here. <laughs> maybe I'll just start like a website spreading um, whiskey conspiracy, conspiracy theories. That could be fun. All right, anyway, so Takara owns Blanton's partially, but not all the way, but Sazerac is contracted to make Blanton's for themselves and for Takara. So it's getting complicated, but Takara, so far as I know, still has some stake in the company today, uh, but it's mostly contractual and mostly, and Josiah's nodding his head, so I'll run with that, um, and involving um, mostly Japanese distribution rights. Okay, so let's talk about Sazerac a little bit. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this a lot because we're here to talk about Buffalo Trace Distillery, which is one subset of the Sazerac Holding Company. But because they are an owner and the current owner, I think it's important. Um, so their origin story is like shockingly complex, um, but it dates back to the 19th century. It's like three companies that, anyway, I won't get into it too much, um, but for a long time, there were spirits importer and distributor but they do go all the way back to a Sazerac coffee house in New Orleans, which yes, had a signature cocktail called the Sazerac, which as some of you may know from our rye whiskey tasting like 10,000 years ago, was originally made with brandy. The brandy was made with one of the spirits that Sazerac imported called Sazerac de Forge et Fils, with my perfect French accent. Nailed it. Um, but then, you might have heard of a little blight called phylloxera, probably, because it was really good for the history of American whiskey. Very bad for French grapes. 
very, very bad for French groups. Still so, bad for French groups. Long story short, um, cognac like did not exist in this country. And so Americans started drinking mostly rye whiskey at the time. So that's why the Sazerac cocktail went from brandy to whiskey. Um, but sometime you should try it with a little bit of both because that's great too. Um, anyway, so they also had the Peychaud's bitters and a bunch of shit. So uh, they expanded in 1980s, as I mentioned before, by buying a couple brands from a little company called Seagram's, which include Benchmark, which is made by Buffalo Trace, um, and then Eagle Rare, which is something that we're tasting today. Those, though, because Sazerac didn't own a distillery at the time, so far as I'm aware of, they didn't make those bourbons, they just owned them. They were made by Heaven Hill and I'm pretty sure that Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill aren't like the best of friends today. But anyway, the Heaven Hill started making these all whiskeys. Friends. Hey, all we're friends. all friends here. We're all friends here. All friends. I'm just saying, we all like some of our friends better than we like other friends. Um, anyway, Ouch. in 1992, by the way, our next tasting is totally the Heaven Hill distillery. So no bad blood here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, 1992, they they bought the distillery though, so they didn't have to work with Heaven Hill, which is I'm pretty sure why Heaven Hill got mad at them because they lost a big fat juicy contract. Um, now back to Buffalo Trace Distillery in 1997. This is the last little bit. We're almost to the whiskey part, so you should be towards the end of your cocktail. Oh, stop. In 1997, um, Sazerac started to dump a lot of money into a re uh, renovation of the distillery. Uh, there were a lot of big overhauls, renovations of the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, oh, sorry, we're still the George T. Stagg Distillery. So these renovations were completed in 1999, at which point it became the Buffalo Trace Distillery. So that brings us up to the future. Um, the Buffalo Trace motto is honor tradition and embrace change. So you've gotten to see a little bit more about the tradition. And we may or may not talk more about that later. Honestly, it depends on how much time we have, but we can always save it for the end. Um, and then uh, similarly, some of the innovation, the embrace change part of that, um, they actually have some pretty cool stuff related to experimentation and innovation baked into their distillery operations. Um, so, I mean, you can see that in the variety of brands they produce. They're currently producing, I think, 21 brands today. So that's a lot. We carry uh, some, but not all of them. Um, some because we can't get them and some because we're too good for them and, you know, a few in between. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they produce, you know, <laughs> and we all have that one brand, right? Um, <laughs> You are swill. Would, <laughs> uh, they, but yeah, so they've got the antique collection, they've got the experimental collection, they've got all this stuff in between. They even have a soda brand, um, I learned. Um, yeah. We don't have that. I have no idea no. how to get it, but I'm sure it's great. It's named after one of their tour guides. Um, Steve. Just I think it's, it's, not it's like Freddy or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Remember that thing I said about stories that aren't quite true? Um, a whale ate me and I lived in it for three days. He was raised. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Buffalo Trace current production capacity is roughly like 2.65 million gallons, which is over 10 million liters. I looked that up of whiskey per year um, and 21 brands, like I said. So that is your uh 20 minute history of buffalo trace so Nailed it. good job hey thanks um i hope you finish your cocktails because now we're going to start drinking whiskey uh so any thoughts or questions go ahead and say it out loud or um toss it in the chat and we'll address uh, it later I, need, I have a question oh yes, Gail. um i'm kind of novice at this but i've heard that there's all if it's a bourbon it has corn mash in it is that true that they all have corn mash is that what makes it a bourbon kind of yes yeah to some extent bourbon legally has to be 51 percent corn oh, uh, oh it, see, i didn't know that so it doesn't have to be 100 percent, and it can have oh. other things in it it could be it could be 100 percent. some of it is um Buffalo Trace doesn't always tell us their exact percentages, but they do give us hints, which mm. we'll talk where, more about later. Where does Pappy's fall in this? 
Uh, we'll get back to that a little bit more when we talk about Weller. Um, but I believe, and Josiah, correct me if I'm wrong, that Pappy, at least it was owned by another company that Buffalo Trace partnered with. That company's the old Van Winkle company, which is owned by the descendants of Van Winkle himself. Okay. That is correct. Yeah. Buffalo Trace only has a partnership with them. We do not own the, the Van Winkle line. We just uh, distribute and produce. That would be a sweet thing to own. I tell you what. <laughs> and it is they're not selling. <laughs> and they're weeded bourbons. As uh, is Weller. Yeah. So that goes to your mash bill question. Okay. Pappy Van Winkle has wheat. Thank you. All right. Let's taste. Let's taste some whiskey because that's what we came here to do. Because it's whiskey tasting time. All right. So first up, Eagle Rare. Uh, and the kind of standard lineup that we have, as usual, is tasting notes first. Uh, it's just nice to hear adjectives and kind of uh, things to help you kind of pull out flavors. Um, sometimes we have really interesting lunch, which is always fucking lovely. Um, but you can't always, you know, sometimes they're all kind of the same. So uh, Eagle Rare. Here's the bottle. Probably a pretty super fucking awesome shot of that, I'm sure. Uh, on the nose, um, complex with toffee, orange peel, herbs, if you're English, honey, leather, and oak. On the palate, bold, dry, delicate, all of those semi-helpful, coffee, tobacco, candied almonds, which I liked, and rich cocoa. Uh, and the finish, dry and lingering. Um, but something that I, I think that's interesting with this too is it just has like a, a sumptuous mouthfeel. Um, it's really, uh, it's interesting to have a 10 year old bourbon uh, for such a good price point. Uh, something that's approachable and you can find that uh, it does kind of hit all the notes. Um, and it's a really just good example of something that you can you can find and it's approachable and kind of a, a above it's a above your your I don't know it's pay great grade? yeah I don't fucking well not about pay grade Jesus Christ all right so uh back to what you were saying about mash bill there uh Bob and Gail uh this is mash bill number one hypothetically uh you have four mash bills within Buffalo Trace uh they are bourbons, right? So it's going to be 51% corn. Um, but mash bill number one is low rye. Uh, and that means that they can throw in any amount of rye um, uh, or any other grain that they want to for the distillation, as long as it's 51% corn. So that makes it bourbon. Um, but so this could be it, since it's a low rye mash bill, it could be a higher percentage of corn, a little bit of rye, a little bit of something else, however, undisclosed. Uh, you also have mash bill number two, which is a which is not this. This is mash bill one. Mash bill two is going to be a high rye uh, bourbon um, and also undisclosed as far as I can tell. Uh, and then you get into weeded bourbons, um, which is also great. Um, for 10-year bourbon, um, I, if you look at most bourbons you can find on the market, um, there are going to be, you know, kind of, I guess, four to 10. But for a, for a four-year, uh, you're going to pay uh, kind of sometimes the same amount, I, which is weird to me. You know, it's interesting that Eagle Rare can produce a 10-year a bourbon uh, for such a good price point, and it really is an approachable thing. Um, that being said, uh, as the world grasps onto bourbon nowadays, uh, and it really is like really grasping onto it, it's insane. Um, even Eagle Rare is getting harder to find, which is like, there's pluses and minuses to that. Uh, you have production times, uh, so if this is a 10-year bourbon, uh, if you uh, did you say earlier how many barrels they produce? Did you make that note, or is that later? In of the... Eagle Rare or Buffalo Just Trace? Just in general. They, no, they it's can later. produce like 
it's 10 million liters or what was that? They can 10 produce million. 10 million liters, but I don't know if they do. Yeah. And, and so you have, it's like when we talked about scotch before, or all these other things, like you have your local market and then you have your like kind of local market and then you have your world market. And so to you and me, like I think a barrel, if I'm going to buy a barrel of whiskey, I think that's a lot of fucking whiskey. <laughs> that's like 50 fucking gallons. I would die to drink that in a year. I mean, that's like a fucking, that's a insane amount of alcohol. Um, but they're producing 10 million liters is 13 and a half million 750 milliliter bottles. And so that number is unfathomable. I don't know what that looks like. I can't just be like, yeah, that's 13 million right there. That's the number. I can't do that. And yet that's all divided up in their brands. So how much goes to Eagle Rare? How much goes to Buffalo Trace? How much goes to all these other brands that they produce? And with all these people like enjoying bourbon and kind of getting into it and then exploring it and then searching for these bottles, how much does that leave uh, for everybody, you know? Uh, so a 10 year bourbon, I think that this is an easy grab. Uh, you see it, you can buy it, you can be happy with it. Um, it is a uh, hypothetically a single barrel um, bourbon, but they don't put that on the label because they're producing so much of it that they're not like keeping track of that necessarily. Uh, so also expect each bottle to be a little bit different, um, which is kind of exciting. It's like when we talked about Brook Lottie, um, or even I have, we have friends that really like Hennessy, for example, cognac and something like Hennessy, they don't, they're just producing so much uh, that a bottle of, one bottle of Hennessy can be absolutely fucking amazing. And another one can be absolute dog shit. <laughs> and you don't know what you're in for, but you're kind of buying on that. Like, like, I know I trust this brand, right? So you can trust Eagle Rare but one bottle could be just like fucking mind blowing, right? That, that single barrel could mess with your head because you'll be like, that's the best ever. <laughs> I bought it for $40 and it's fucking amazing. Um, while uh, the, the brand came where it was created, was birthed uh, in 1975 uh, and it was a com uh, competitor for Wild Turkey and it was released at 101 proof. Um, that's interesting because wild turkey sucks. Uh, and so they clearly won, uh, any wild turkey lovers out there do your thing. It's kind of dog shit. However, I will say, uh, Russell's reserve, which is their like step up, uh, is delightful. And I think it's one of my favorites, um, kind of Eagle rare budget quality bourbons. So I would put, I would never put Eagle rare against wild turkey because I would just probably dump out the wild turkey and drink the Eagle <laughs> Rare but I would put Russell's Reserve 10-year and Eagle Rare 10-year together I think that they're very quality bourbons um they no longer release it at 101 however Eagle Rare 17 which is part of the antique collection which is these like special releases that they do every year um within each of their like releases they do like a special release and so Eagle Rare has a 17 uh, and that has been released at 101 proof uh, as an homage to the past recently um, and they also have double eagle best of luck I don't even know if that's in the fucking state uh, and if it is I don't fucking have it nor will I have it um, I won't even get fucking Eagle Rare 17 so uh, those so if you ever need to get Chris like a really nice birthday present, yeah. it might cost you like 10 grand or 15 on the secondary market or, or 20. Yeah. I'll accept. Gladly. Nothing says I love yeah. you like a bottle of double eagle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then if you're looking at, if, if you start to get into bourbon, which you so already many, are. Yeah, you already are. You're already here. Uh, there's a website called breakingbourbon.com. Uh, just type it in, take a look at it or write it down. Uh, I actually use it all the time because they have like tasting notes and they have all these interesting things, um, which is kind of a good read. But if you're just ever wondering like when a release is coming, these guys are doing the research to find it. So I, you know, sometimes I don't even get the fucking information from people 
like my reps, they don't fucking know. And I'll go to breakingbourbon.com and they'll be like, September is the release for this, that, and the other. And so I'm like, hey, motherfucker, I'm looking for this thing. And they're like, oh yeah, you're right. That's released right now. And I'm like, thank God I asked. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're ever looking for like release dates of something, cause you want to become a bourbon hunter and just cruise the fucking total wines and the small liquor stores of the world, uh, that will be a guide for you to find those kind of things. It's kind of um, worth looking at some of those sites because I, like you've probably all heard that sometimes you can find a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle at Costco, which is true, or at least it used to be before COVID. Still true. Um, but yeah, well, I don't know if they're going to Total Wine anymore, but um, anyway, uh, they'll tell you like, cause that, you know, you got to show up that day early in the morning, know what you're looking for. And that website will tell you like, look for this thing on this day and well, not you might this find it. Day. Well, okay, you get what I'm saying. This month, possibly, maybe. This day, plus or minus, yeah. like, 10 days. Know that it was, it shall be released on this month. Anyways, that's Eagle Rare. Do you want to um, oh. look at Mark or Cheryl's question? Uh, how does bourbon get its flavor? Is it like wine where different temperature impacts grape growing tastes? Same with corn. Um, so, I think that predominantly uh, bourbon is getting its flavor from time. Um, there is something to be said for distillation and I absolutely agree that some distillers are far better than, better than others. You cannot dispute that, um, but it's not the same as vinification. So when you're making wine, like pulling it at the right time, uh, just the whole step, all of it, uh, vinification is I would argue maybe more intricate. Um, I'm not a wine person, um, but I will say vinification is fucking difficult uh, and your competition is heavy. Distilling something, you, you do have to care about where the grain comes from. Is it organic? Is it not organic? Uh, who, who made it? Under what conditions? That all matters for sure. Um, but in general, as a general rule, uh, you're just looking at quality of barrel and time um, and terroir. Uh, so you would be saying something like the South where it's like really hot sometimes and then it gets cold. Um, you get a lot of action on the wood, which is a very funny reference for me always. Um, but you it's one just- of Chris's favorite terms. It's an innuendo endlessly. Uh, but so you- you just get these these uh, nice flavors, um, but there's actual like chemical reactions that are happening over time. That's a big reason why Scotch um, kind of ruled the market for so long is because they're waiting 12 years to release a product in a low temperature environment, but the chemical compounds that change over time, it's real. I mean, you really, some people try to rush it and, and it's just, you, you can't, you know, uh, which is, it kind of holds you, you know, and it makes people honest in a way, you know, if, if you taste a whiskey and you, and they don't have an age statement on it, or you, you can kind of tell, you know, it's not, not that that's like a, the end all be all judgment, you know, you have finishing and, and kind of things like that. But uh, I guess time is the best answer. Time and like ingredients. I mean, one thing we learned with Brooklotti is their, the extent to which they value terroir in a way that other scotch producers don't so they have um like farm to bottle barley so you can look up what harvest your barley came from and taste differences among the different farms the different locations of farms and the way that the barley was handled um so i believe buffalo trace well so they recently started farming their own corn um and i believe they they use non-GMO, is that right, Josiah? So, they, I mean, by upping their corn game, that I think could very well have a significant impact on flavor. And it, it also plays into the mash bill uh, recipes, which they don't share because that matters too. So um, you could do 100% corn and you have all these percentages in between, that will matter on your end product. Okay. Mash bills. All right, next whiskey before we talk too long on Eagle Bear. I know, it's already 7.45 and we've tasted one of five. Fucking failing. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Ricardo is definitely 
bopping along over there. Carlos jamming out. <laughs> He's making a mixtape. Um, okay, so Blanton's, or if you're from Renton, you pronounce it Blanton's. Uh, I'll oh, start with it. Red <laughs> Renton dig. <laughs> Sorry if you're from Renton. <laughs> they totally say that, though. That's hilarious. Um, you're right. I work in Renton. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you mean Renton? <laughs> it's Renton. <laughs> Uh, okay, so and they say mountain. <laughs> <laughs> mountain, yeah, you can see the mountain from Britain sometimes when you're drinking your Blanton. Uh, okay, no, <laughs> fresh citrus. No hate, no hate for South Tasting Seattle. notes, tasting notes. Fresh citrus, orange peel, nutmeg, clove, spicy caramel, vanilla, and toffee. Remember, you don't have to smell all of these or taste all of these, but the more adjectives we throw your way, the better odds something will stick. So just write down the ones that stick with you and that'll be what stays in your brain. Also, that's how you can learn to identify new flavors. On the palate, uh, raisin, caramel, demerara, which you should know because you drink our cocktails as a type of sugar, very rich, flavorful sugar. Import brown sugar, it's badass. Uh, yeah, we use it in... Um, well, whatever, lots of drinks. Yeah. Uh, still on the palate, orange, spice, corn, which is just one of those adjectives people use that I'm like, oh really, your bourbon tastes like corn, um, and a little floral hint. Uh, finish alcohol is another one of my favorite descriptors. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, on the finish, you can find burned sugar, caramel, vanilla, toasted nut, oak, and a long lasting finish. All righty. We'll talk about the whiskey and then we'll talk about the guy and I'll try not to take forever doing so. So Bland's was released in 1984, as you'll recall. Um, they say it is the world's first single barrel bourbon. Um, I have no idea if that's true, but as far as I know, nobody else is saying that theirs is the first, so odds are high. Uh, it doesn't have an age statement on it, but it's usually about six years old. Um, but this does depend on aging conditions. So that's why there's not an age statement on it. Um, cause they pick the barrel based on flavor, not on age. Um, and different barrels react differently because these are aged in a metal warehouse, which as you can imagine, makes the inside feel an awful lot like the outside. So it changes season to season and year to year. Um, so it is made from the more rye dominant mash bill number two, which if you'll flip back through the chat, Josiah put a note in there about mash bill number two. Um, and it is also called the age international mash bill or age or ancient age. Anyway, read his note. He knows what he's talking about. Um, the bottle shape I looked up, by the way, this is the bottle. It's weird. I looked up the shape. It's called a uh, it's a dodecahedron. No, it's not. It's called something fucking ridiculous. I know that because it's, it's called a hava cuboctahedron. So that'll be on the test later, by the way. Um, and it's got a little horsey at the top. And there's eight different horsies, and they're all different. And they all have a letter. They make a pictogram. They do make a pictogram of a horse winning a race. It wins. You can tell at the end. The letters, if you can imagine, there's eight of them, and they spell out blank ends, no apostrophe. Um, and those bottle tops were first released in 1999 as a collector's edition. It was so popular, they never stopped. I'm assuming that's why they never stopped, but it's cool. So young Calnero has not actually collected all eight yet, but we also are suckers, <coughs> excuse me, for when people like really want one and ask if we have it, even if it's only when we have, we've given them away before, so. Like every time, we only have three letters, I but know. we just give them away. We're suckers. So if you need a letter. <laughs> we probably don't have it because we probably already gave it away. So um, as you recall, 1984 was shit for bourbon time-wise. Um, the industry was like plummeting, um, but it launched this like super ultra premium category within bourbon, which was kind of a ballsy move at the time, um, but the concept really worked out. So this is part of bourbon's pivot and whatever it is, something stuck and humanity came back around to bourbon. Um, and it is now one of the fastest growing spirit categories in the world. Um, so clearly that idea worked out well. Today, almost everybody that makes bourbon has a single barrel spirit line. Like almost everybody that's anybody. Um, 
Okay, so let's talk about Blanton the man. Remember, his middle name is Bacon, uh, but he goes by A.B. Blanton. So he started working at the distillery in 1897 when he was 16 years old. He uh, worked his way from the bottom to the top like a true good old-fashioned American. Bootstraps. Uh, so he went from office clerk to president, and he was president during a few genuine shitstorms. So uh, as you'll recall, in 1917, the distillery, maybe, ceased operations briefly and then sold to, um, from Duffy to Blanton to Nalen. Um, and then, so that all happened in like 1917, 18, 19, and then he became president in 1921. So he was like, I think 40-ish at the time. Um, so in 1921, you'll recall, was a very dark time in American history known as prohibition. Except that we all know now that there was a fucking pandemic uh, the year before, which nobody talks about for some reason. That's true. Full fucking circle. <laughs> right. Continue. Sorry. Well, there was World War One, and as we all know, the Spanish flu was started by American soldiers that brought it to Spain. Typical us. Anyway, um, so prohibition. Uh, so as you can imagine, the U.S. government basically shut down distillation, but because of grandpa's medicine, they literally allowed some distilleries to continue storing and selling. So you had to get a special permit, and these were very rare permits, to be able to store securely your whiskey and sell. Otherwise, they literally made you dump it out. And then later, when those stocks started to disappear, there was another permit available that allowed you to produce whiskey for medicinal purposes, of course. Um, so Blanton got both of those permits. By the time prohibition ended, there were four distilleries that were allowed to produce whiskey. So that was a very important thing to do. There were slightly more permits that allowed you to store and sell the whiskey, which means that um, Stag Distillery at the time was allowed to produce whiskey for other distilleries as well. So that was enough to help them survive prohibition. Though it wasn't pretty. Um, they survived, but they really scaled back and the place kind of started to fall into decay. They repurposed a lot of the buildings at the distillery. So for example, a lot of the warehouses became office buildings or they used them to store other stuff for other people um, because the whiskey wasn't keeping it in business. So uh, the owner at the time, that guy Nalen, he like 1929, I think is when they were allowed to start producing again. He wasn't really interested or able to invest what was needed to bring the distillery back to production and like, expansion. Um, so Blanton was like, well, then you have to sell it. So he helped orchestrate the sale to Shenley Corporation. Um, so they bought it. They started investing in bringing it back up. They were producing again by 1930. And then it was only three years until repeal. Yay. Um, but then you had the Great Depression. Ooh. So Blanton got them through that. Luckily, the depression was a lot better for alcohol consumption than prohibition was. Prohibition was bad. People drank during the depression. So what the fuck else are you going to do? Um, Here's my there last was, dollar. They do it every time. Um, there was a flood in 1937. And the <laughs> just like totally engulfed the distillery. It crested at 17 feet high. So you can imagine the damage that would do. It was the river that flooded. Um, and Blanton had the distillery operating again within 24 hours of that flood, which is crazy. I don't know what the fuck he did. The furnaces drive away the water. He had everybody blowing on the water really hard. Brought in a bunch of raccoons to drink. I don't know what he did, but he had it working again really fast. Camels. Um, and here's an interesting tidbit, because after that, there was World War II. So the poor guy just can't catch a break. But they had to stop making whiskey in World War II but they were still operating because they were making alcohol for the war effort. So that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, it just fucks up like stocks later down the line because uh, you can't put anything in barrel. So 
while he was going through shitstorm after shitstorm after shitstorm, Blanton managed to expand the Stag Distillery from 44 to 144 buildings. And this was in part through help from Shenley's investment. Um, so they had this like massive expansion that he oversaw because, I mean, prohibition was ending. They saw it coming and then it happened. And so they were like, people are thirsty and they were right. So they just ramped the fuck up. Remember I said only four distilleries were producing by the time prohibition ended. So if you were smart and you had money, you threw it at your distillery, which is precisely what they did and it worked out well for them. Um, so this made stay the largest distillery of its time. I don't know if that's in the world or in the US, but it was huge. Um, he, in this time, built a lot of warehouses, but one of them was Warehouse H, which was his favorite. That's the metal one. Um, so you got these like massive temperature fluctuations because metal, you know, conducts heat faster than pretty much anything else. Um, and copper. Uh, so when he had special guests or dignitaries or what have you visiting, he was known for his habit of going to Warehouse H and picking out what he called a honey barrel. So like a really nice barrel, maybe from his favorite spot within the warehouse. Um, and he'd pull out that barrel and have a bottle directly from the barrel, um, which was kind of an old fashioned way of doing it because blending was where you could get some of those really magical complex flavors. So he was just doing this single barrel thing. Um, and then when Elmer T. Lee was master distiller and was tasked with coming up with this like super ultra premium bourbon, he decided to, first of all, name it after Blanton, who's notorious for not hiring Lee and then giving in later and hiring him. Um, but he was Lee's mentor and uh, he wanted to name the bourbon after Blanton and also style it in the practice of how he liked to drink it. Um, thus, we got the single barrel. And that's Blanton's for you. All right. Bam, Blanton's. Were you keeping an eye over here? Dodecahedrons. Rhombic Cuba, yeah. It's a, I mean, that shape is, I don't know why it's shaped that way. Josiah, do you know why the bottle is that Rhombic Cubahedron? Because it's cool. Um, I've, I've looked for that a number of times and I, I have not found an answer, honestly. My, the only thing I could extrapolate is uh, just a stylistic decision um, because it was going to the Japanese market. Kind of looks like a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. It's eye catching for sure. It is that. It's annoyingly fat if you're a bar owner. Just make my <laughs> thoughts on that known, but they make up for it with Eagle Rare. <laughs> All right. I have, a, Taylor. I have a question. Question. I meant it's questions. Hi, Mom. Hi, how are you? So medicinal purposes only, um, in anticipation of something in the future, what kind of diagnosis should I be looking for to get the medicinal purpose uh, prescription? Cholera. Depression, probably. Sour disposition. Mm. Uh, gout, maybe, at the time. Gout's good. Gout will get you it. <laughs> Which is a little ironic. Nerves? Mom, I think you should really aim for a diagnosis of nerves. Uh, yeah, back pain. Can't prove it. Mm. I, I told you to just go for crotchety old person. Yeah. That. yeah, definitely helps with that. It's a prophylactic measure. We give it to you to protect us. <laughs> there you go. There's like 10 ideas for you. Write that down. Uh, and Brian and Mara say tuberculosis also. So that one they can test for though but you need whiskey in order to test for it. All right, E.H. Taylor, we're moving on. And so usually I would take this whiskey and then Callie would take the next whiskey and then I would take the last whiskey. However, what we are tasting tonight is E.H. Taylor, the small batch, uh, and then E.H. Taylor, the barrel proof. Um, so I'm just gonna take both of them at the same time. We're shaking things up. Woo, get ready. That was, a, that was she said joke. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so uh, let's start with tasting notes. Um, on the nose, butterscotch, caramel, vanilla, baked multigrain bread, licorice, dried raisins, cherries, brown sugar, and alcohol. Perfect. Uh, on the palate, Caramel corn sweetness, 
which is a tricky way of saying corn, butterscotch, licorice, raisins, oak, vanilla, uh, a light floral note, spice, simple but balanced. And the finish is gonna be soft with pepper, tobacco, leather, vanilla, and lingering dried apricot. It's fun. All right, there is a lot. And so uh, realize that the E.H. Taylor, and which you got the coaster for, which is fucking sweet, uh, is going to be uh, more mellow than your barrel proof because your barrel proof is uncut, unfiltered. Um, however, E.H. Uh, e. Taylor uh, is non-chill filtered in general, uh, which big thumbs up for me because takes away a lot of the flavor. Uh, you have those oils, you have those intricacies that come with uh, with your whiskey and sometimes people chill filter them out. So huge plus to not do that. Um, this, uh, the E.H. Taylor small batch is 50% uh, ABV, so still gonna be a powerhouse. Um, they, it is about eight years old. Um, that's an average, so don't quote me on that, but about eight years old. Uh, and it is uh, rye mash bill number one again. Um, it is Asian warehouse C, which E.H. Taylor uh, temperature controlled. And so this is when like using a steam heater would have been high fucking falutin technology. Uh, and so to have a controlled temperature warehouse is a big deal. And like Callie was saying earlier, um, lots of Buffalo Trace uh, product is dependent on where it is stored within said warehouse. So you have tin, you have tin warehouses, you have brick, you have fucking all kinds of stuff, right? And if it's stored on the outside or the inside, if it's stored high, like second story or first story, all of those temperature changes, all those little differences to determine which whiskey goes into which line of product. Um, and so this is a warehouse C product, uh, which is great. Um, the amount of whiskeys within E.H. Taylor is significant. Uh, this is kind of a, this is kind of a higher end uh, label for them. Uh, so the small batch, I would say is like findable. I'm not gonna say easy to find, um, but you can find it. It's out there. You know, we have bottles, QFC has bottles, but then again, you know, next month they might not. Uh, and then they'll have them again. That's just the small batch. Once you get into other shit, it gets really it, much more complicated. The rye, the straight rye, really hard to come by. It's a year really, yearly release and just not easy to find. This barrel proof, um, you know, it, it's released every once in a while, I feel like, maybe yearly, but uh, I think it's yearly, but twice a year. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Um, but again, not in large quantities. So it's just a little bit comes out. Uh, they have really crazy releases. Like this year, they released uh, 18 year marriage, which was a blend of three whiskeys, all 18 years old. Uh, and only one person in this room might have possibly ever had a taste of that. Uh, and uh, that shit's rare as fuck. Um, so nicely done. Uh, I'm not jealous. I'm just a little jealous that you got to taste that. Yeah, that one person is not either of us. Yeah, it's not <laughs> us. Um, and you know, we got an amaranth in the house um, we, and we sold through it, um, but it was beautiful. An amaranth is a type of grain and they did a special distillation for that. Uh, and so this is Buffalo Trace's kind of like experimental, um, really thoughtful kind of line. Um, so if you ever see an E.H. Taylor on the shelf, uh, it's, it's an easy go-to. Uh, moving into your barrel proof, now compare them. Uh, tasty notes are pretty similar. Um, on the nose, cooked berries, rich caramel, slightly floral. Again, you're going to get that. It's, it's more, it's higher, right? It's like, uh, what is this? 129.3 proof, so 64% alcohol by volume. That's a, that's a tongue scorcher. Um, it's going to be on the palate, bold 
spicy toasted vanilla dried oak pepper uh, and then the finish is long and powerful rye lingering fruits um, some people uh, come in and now that we're like a miniature liquor store people ask all the time like hey can I get a bottle of this can I get a bottle of that the answer is fuck no uh, and the reason is because there's allocations and so the way allocations work is say little old us that opened up a tiny little liquor store uh, and then we're a bar we move through x amount of whatever bottles of buffalo trace or whatever have you and then they say, all right, you're X amount high on sales. You have earned these bottles. Here's your bottle. We can't compete with liquor stores um, for volume. Uh, and so, you know, we'll get one bottle of bar barrel proof, but if, if it makes you feel any better, they get 12. And they probably sold fucking not 12 times more than us. They probably sold 50 times more than us of this specific brand. Um, so if you ever want a bottle, there's a couple things of advice. First of all, don't get into bourbon. That's my first advice. Uh, second advice is shop at the same place all the time. Uh, third advice is make friends with the people that you shop at all the time, uh, especially like little liquor stores, um, which shall not be smaller than 10,000 square feet. We don't count as a small liquor store. I cannot get you those bottles. Sorry. Uh, you could go... Uh, bourbon hunting, which is where you just go around willy nilly and just stop into random fucking liquor stores and try to find shit. Kind of works sometimes, actually. Uh, or you can just go to Kentucky. Uh, also, not a guarantee. But those are all good options. Um, e. H. Taylor uh, was a very. I'm going to try to rush through this a little bit, but um, you have a the bottled in bond act. Uh, which is why E.H. Taylor, the small batch, is at a hundred proof. Bottle and Bond is this big action where people were making whiskey and they were getting taxed on it before they sold it. And then they had to sit on it for X amount of years. That is a huge burden on the people producing spirits. You, you have to front all this money, not only the money for like labor and product, but just taxation. I mean, you get taxed on something you're not selling for fucking four years. And so E.H. Taylor was a, a big part of big part of that. Um, and so just really on top of it, uh, helping the bourbon industry be able to make it through all that tax taxation problems. Uh, sour mash. Uh, sour mash um, is something that is kind of misconstrued. It's very interesting stuff. Um, and like 97% of distilleries do it. However, E.H. Taylor was kind of early in the game on like kind of trying to make that more consistent. Sour mash is you make a mash. So say it's 51% corn, so it's bourbon, 49% rye, probably not realistic, but let's just use that as an example. Uh, you distill that and then you take the spent mash that all the liquid has gone from and you take some percentage of that mash, whether it be 3% or 30%, you put that into the new mash, you pour it in and you stir it in. And what it gives you is consistency. It, um, it affects uh, I don't know, amino acids and yeasts and all these like bacteria. bacteria uh, and it just kind of keeps a consistent product. Um, so don't think of it like sourdough bread. And San Francisco is super fucking famous because they have the oldest fucking starter and whoever has the oldest starter wins right like you it, it it matters for that reason so sour mash whiskey is the same so this is a sour mash whiskey as all whiskeys probably should be uh the ones that are not i don't know why they fucking wouldn't um it provides consistency um and i think those were kind of the big points for eh taylor and those are some big ones um and it's interesting too, uh, moving forward for uh, Taylor um, and all of these lines is the amount of product that they can produce now with the warehouses they have now and the warehouses they're going to build. I'll be curious to see uh, what they choose to build um, because that will affect the whiskeys that come out. So they could build 
warehouses that are built for Buffalo Trace and then all of their current warehouses become all these higher end lines because they're older and they have this, you know, more volatile terroir kind of situation going on where they could create all these like high end temperature controlled places. Um, but that being said, this is temperature controlled. Uh, and so they're looking for that consistent mellow product. I mean, at eight years, as opposed to like four years, uh, you know, this is a really great whiskey. Um, and, and because of the balance of temperature control, you know, you have Eagle Rare 10 year, which is cheaper for 10 years than your E.H. Taylor eight-ish year, but just a more thoughtful product, I guess. Um, so I'll be excited to see what they do trying to keep up with production. Done. Very good. Questions. Uh, we were wondering to go bourbon hunting if you need a dog. And if so, what kind of dog do you go, do you need to go bourbon hunting with? You need a very expensive dog that you can sell in exchange for bourbon. Truffle hunter. Yeah. There, the bourbon is underneath the truffles. Eat a salty dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple salty dogs to help you find anything. Or an old dog, an industry veteran. You need a Shiba Inu because it's Japanese. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It'll help you find the Japanese only bourbon. Yeah, because you got to go to Japan to pick it up, which is where you find the Blantons. And whatever else. All right. Oh, and so the barrel proof was a very, it's kind of a harder bottle to find. But what Callie's talking about next is our unicorn bottle. That was a fucking horn on it. Look. So Weller, single barrel, speaking of. Um, good fucking luck trying to find one of these. No, you can find it. It's only like $600 or. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, somebody looked up the double eagle and it clocked in at 20 grand. Um, I think I looked this one up earlier and it was only like 5,000 on one website. So totally affordable in comparison. Uh, we didn't pay that much for this bottle, but we're also not gouging you. We love to get cool bottles like this and so split it into 25 welcome. one ounce samples because that way we get to share it with 25 people. If we sold shots at the bar, we could only share it with 12 people and nobody can see our back bar these days. So this is this is more fun. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll start with tasting notes. Um, you get a lot of uh, fruit on the nose of this one, cherry, blackberry, strawberry, what have you. Um, you can also find cinnamon, mint, honey, toffee, brown butter, vanilla, chocolate, oak, and my favorite, alcohol. There's alcohol in this. There is a careful. Deep. Yeah. 48.5% uh, think it's on your sheet. That's so mellow. On Five the palate, minutes. you can find caramel, baking spices, cocoa, luscious and rich, oak, tobacco, black tea, black pepper, cinnamon, strawberry, light vanilla, and a light burn. So it might come across as hot in the beginning, but honestly, the longer it sits in the glass, the more that alcohol burn chills out. Uh, the finish, cinnamon, coffee, black pepper, smoky sweet oak and a pleasant tingle so this one actually i read through a lot of folks reviews of this one and a lot of people said try pairing it with food um which is kind of unique but uh, especially chocolate so apparently if you have a little bit of chocolate you can get more of those baking spices out of this so if you have some lying around uh maybe give it a whirl all right um, so interestingly, usually on single barrel, so like the Blanton's bottle, I don't know how well you can read that, but there's like a handwritten note there saying <laughs> what lot this is from, what barrel, where in the warehouse, which warehouse, like every imaginable, pe imaginable piece of identification is written on that Blanton's bottle. Um, Weller, there's like nothing. So it's a single barrel, but you don't know what you're gonna get. So that's kind of unique, um, adds to the mystique. Also, you notice I threw a lot of adjectives your direction. That's because not everybody tasting this thing is tasting 
the same bottle. So we threw some of ours in there, some of other people's. I don't know what the fuck they were tasting. Could have been the same one, could have been different, but I figure it's like ballpark. I also pulled the um, the distiller's notes. Um, so do, 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 lost some spot again. Oh, um, average age for this guy is seven years old, um, but like other single barrels that fluctuates a lot. So no age statement there. The, ma the mash bill is wheated. Um, and often as a result compared to Pappy products, um, also because the guy it's named after, William LaRue Weller, uh, is famous in part for being the guy that hired Pappy, Mr. Julian Van Winkle, the older, um, otherwise known as Pappy. I think there was a P somewhere in his name, but I don't remember. Um, P Pappy? It was Julian. I'm going to go with P Pappy. P Van Winkle. Maybe. Or just, anyway, Pappy for short. Um, too many names. So uh, Weller was known for his weeded mash bills, or his family was. So he came from, so the LaRue and the Weller are both distilling families. So William LaRue Weller, LaRue was his mom's side of the family, Weller was his dad's side, and they, they're both like generations old distillers. So they had this like family recipe where they basically took out some of the rye from a normal bourbon mash bill and put in wheat, which was kind of unique at the time. So Weller and Pappy are made with a more wheated mash bill. So it's kind of this soft, gentle flavor, very pleasant, obviously. Fucking everybody wants a bottle. Wheated it's bourbon ridiculous. is the best. So good. Um, so Weller himself, though, wasn't really a distiller. He was a merchant. And so he kind of, he like told other people the whiskey that he wanted them to make for him, which had this weeded mash bill, but he didn't make it, um, so far as I can tell. Uh, so uh, he hired uh, Van Winkle in 1893 as a salesman. So Van Winkle worked for Weller selling Weller's stuff. Um, and then Weller died as we all do eventually, um, in 1899. So Van and Winkle stayed on with the company, which was being run by Weller's oldest son, uh, George, I think was his name. Um, there was another guy working there called Alex Farnsley. And so Winkle and Farnsley got together in 1908 and bought Weller Company. They kept Weller's son on as president for a while um, until prohibition, when things obviously started to contract. So there was the distillery that was making Weller at the time, you might have heard of, it's called Stitzel Distillery. And so sometime during Prohibition, Stitzel and Weller joined forces to create Stitzel Weller, which came out in 1935. It's a brilliant naming. On Derby Day, they always say that. It was released on Derby Day, which is apparently a big deal in Kentucky or something. Um, so I go to that. that is a big deal. I would love to go to Derby Day. I totally mm. read that Hunter S. Thompson book. I'm fascinated. We're going. We're going to wear fucking big hats and suits. Okay, stay on target. Sorry. The distillery gained incredible notoriety until 1972 when it sold. Um, and then the new guys came in and named it the Old Fitzgerald Distillery, which perhaps you've heard of as well. Um, but they changed the name back in 92. Um, so it, uh, the distillery itself is currently owned by Bullet, which is owned by Diageo. Um, and they use it as like a tourist attraction and for storage, they don't really make anything there. I think they do like a couple like teeny experimental things, but it's not really a distillery anymore, but it's still around. However, um, as a condition of the sale, Van Winkle's son, whose name is also Julian Van Winkle um, Jr., he built into the sale of the distillery access to their old stock and rights to the Van Winkle brand. So that's how the Van Winkles still own the Van Winkles, but they partner with Buffalo Trace to make it happen. Okay, that's it. So now, Chris, you can go off on tangents. Tangents, all right, I have a tangent. I didn't actually have one ready. All right, I'm gonna read through the chat then, <laughs> unless anyone had any questions. You just called me out hard. I didn't have one ready. You were already interrupting me. What were you gonna say? Hey, Chris, I have a question. Yes. The question is, I have a bottle of Weller Special Reserve. Yes, Ooh. nice bottle. Yeah. Yes, it was a gift from a friend. Can yeah. I get more? 
from us, no. In general, yes, you absolutely can. And also, I don't think any of us should be getting into necessarily the whiskey future game. So you might read about it in magazines. It's like the whiskey futures is a real investment. And that was an article probably written by some bourbon hunter to convince his family that it's okay that he buys so much bourbon. It should yeah. be drank. You know, you, if you're- it, That's why I'm drinking it. That's why yeah, I'm drinking that shit. Yeah, and-, and Yeah, hope, yeah, no, but I want another bottle. Well, and just hope you find one. So if you find one, fucking buy it, but don't sit on it because you're like hopeful that you'll like maybe find, no, no. you know, you don't think that you have to find a replacement bottle before you drink it. Just no, 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 yeah, no, no, I'm drinking. Think that whiskey I'm drinking. is a good game to get in if you don't like whiskey, because then it's just transactionary. But you're also like a scalper. You're making a living out of fucking people over. Yeah, yeah so but see, I, my, my problem is I like whiskey. That's not a problem. I mean, or it is, I don't know. But so I wanted to buy a bottle of the McAllen Winchester, which is a $50,000 bottle of McAllen. And I was like, listen, we'll just buy it. We'll store it. We'll just put it downstairs. And in 20 years, we'll sell it. And Callie, because she's smarter than I am, said, well, you'll want to drink it. And I was like, fuck, we need yeah. to buy two. <laughs> it's only $100,000. It's fine. We'll buy two. We'll drink one. And then I put you on a house someday. Yeah. And so we didn't buy it. Um, yeah. So we've been getting a lot of requests for the Kilnero Travel Agency. Um, we'll totally add Derby Day to the list. So I would love it. I do have a giant hat, actually. We no, it's on our no, that's on our bucket list. That's it's on good. our bucket list. Yeah. And we're old and we're going. You have to fucking go. And I will save yeah. you from Here's the disappointment. Hat. We oh. we tried, we bought this hat. I dressed up in a suit and we went to Emerald Downs because we're like, it's fucking derby day. And we walk in there all confident. And then when we get there, we're like, wow, nobody's dressed up. This is weird. And we walked up to the bar and we're like, we'll take two mint juleps. And the lady's like, the fuck is a mint julep? <laughs> we're like, where the fuck are we? This isn't fucking Derby Day. You know where we were. We were on the reservation. We were Derby we were Day. Brandon. Yeah. Chris. Jesus will, Christ, don't do that. No, you were in like Auburn. That's a definite yeah. difference. I will buy your steer sucker suit for Derby Day because oh, oh hell yes, one has to so be terrible. All right, folks. So we're going to transition now. So here's the part where we. And if you want to sign off, I'm offended because our presentation. One did. Um, Accidentally, my bad. You're welcome. Oh. And uh, and we'll do a little more Q and A. So, thank you all so much. Oh, and I guess we should tell you. Oh yeah, news first. We have uh, news, fun news. We do have some news. Some of you might know, um, but. The truth is, I, um, sitting next to this bottle, there's a little left, you can see. There's always 25.6 you know, ounces, there's 25 of you, which means 0.3 for each of us. But I didn't try it because uh, we are expecting a little baby Kilnero in July. Oh, hey. yeah. Congratulations. So, first one, so. I, I did it. it was me. <laughs> With that big dick of yours, oh. right? Yep, it was yeah. Chris's big dick. Made it happen. <laughs> That's just on the it internet. Works. It's on the internet It's because now. of all the action on the wood. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, something to look forward to during these crazy times, but there will all be right. a lot yes. of us in July. If all We're goes well. For you. So far, so good. <laughs> What's the due date? July what? July 21st. Oh, cool. Sweet. And I'm already rocking, this is the best thing ever, but I'm rocking my like expandable waistline pants and it is, <laughs> awesome. I suggest everyone gets an expandable waistline built into their jeans. They just have that now. It's called stretchy pants. <laughs> yeah. They're I have it. They make those stretchy, stretchy pants, pants when I was pregnant. <laughs> congratulations, you guys. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> I got flustered. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a big announcement. So that's a thing that we did. Yeah. We sure did. Um, oh, uh, and then uh, also on the same vein, um, we are thinking, because I'm Chris with a K and she's uh, Callie with a K, four letter K names. So we got mm -hmm. Kean, 
K-I-A-N on the docket. Uh, Cade, K-A-D-E, which I really like actually. Kind of KD? very strong, uh -huh. like bull. Yeah. K-H-A-I. Uh, so if anybody has any ideas, feel free to float them. We have like fucking six months to figure it out. So no okay. rush. Kiernan? Uh, so just in case no, you're like, four letters. oh, it has to be four letters. Yeah, yeah no, don't mess it up, Gail. Four letters. Can we do cash with a K? Yes, and a money symbol. <laughs> yeah, a money people? symbol instead of an S. Yeah, that'd be so good. Rico has about, four about, letters. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is that one? The chat. We'll check it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, cash is perfect. <laughs> yeah, rock that shit. Dad, did you have a question? Oh, I was just gonna say kale. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, kale came up. It's good. Yeah. Healthy. A little close to Cali, though, maybe. Dad, what what was your question? Oh, I would, I when you're done with the name part, um, I'd be interested in hearing about the the closing cocktail for those of us that. Oh yeah, sorry, we got distracted. Closing cocktail. So it's the darker one there. Uh, it is a Black Manhattan, um, but we made it with Sazerac rye instead. So Sazerac is a uh, six-year rye. Um, and, you know, we come up with new cocktails all the time for these tastings. And we were just kind of like, it, let's just sub in Sazerac rye because it's a good fucking drink. So we figured we could end you on something that we like know is good. To be fair, Lots of the times you're fucking guinea pigs because we're making all these cocktails and we're like a little bit of this and a little bit of magic and we'll put it in a bottle. And if anybody writes back like that was amazing, yeah, maybe it'll make it onto a list somewhere. <laughs> uh, and so Black Manhattan, easy winner, undiluted. Uh, so feel free to put it over the rocks because there is no water in that. Um, or stir it up if you have a mixing vessel or something like that. Also, if you drink it straight, Fucking get after it. No big deal. Won't hurt you. Uh, it's luscious. Um, next tasting is Heaven Hill in two weeks. Um, the problem with the Black Manhattan is when you split it between two coupe glasses, it's not quite high enough for me to show off on the video my new coupe glasses that have the Kelnera logo on them. Yeah, those are pretty yeah. sweet. That's the... Uh advantage you get for being my sister <laughs> so you get experimental swag <laughs> um yeah we we are working on branded coupe glasses that are less than a million dollars each which is about where we're at right now the it, it's the cost is insane i'd like to sell you a coupe glass that says calnero but they cost us an exorbitant amount and so i'd rather just break them in the back alleyway out of spite for how much they cost us <laughs> it's fucking bullshit <laughs> Silly Anyways, things. so Heaven Hill is going to be similar structure to today, obviously different brands, but we've got a couple humdingers in there. Um, we do still have some space in that one. Uh, this one sold out. Heaven Hill is going to sell out. Um, so if you're interested, sign up now. You got two weeks. Kelnero Toast Tab. Toasttab.com slash Kelnero. Yeah, you type it in, it'll work. It, yeah, it's out there. Um, it's Google. Yeah, next week we're taking off. His brother's getting married. Um, thanks, Alan. <laughs> That's the link. Um, and then we don't actually have any scheduled for February yet, but uh, we do have our birthday. So Kilnero is turning two on the 13th. And it's the terrible twos, everyone. Valentine's Day on the 14th. And then just fun fact, our wedding anniversary on the 15th. And it'll be six years six years six years for sure um so yeah <laughs> so which means we were married four years when we opened kill now isn't that fun mm. um but you know you just can't fucking pick when you get your permits approved so that's when we open the bar anyway my point is we're gonna have some awesome specials leading up to that weekend so two weeks of specials what we're gonna do is a countdown it's fun of all sorry i was just getting excited jesus christ such a fine we're going to do a countdown of Kelnero's best-selling cocktails over the past two years. So the 12th most popular will release on February 1st, and whatever the cocktail that day will be just $10. Um, so a pretty screaming deal. Um, so you know that some of those favorites like Black Rose, Black Walnut Manhattan, those are going to be popping up towards the end. And then on the actual birthday, I'm back. <laughs> Time out was we're going to have 
all of them available for $10. So it's gonna be a party, except we can't have parties yet. So you can get it to go as well um, for the whole thing. Um, so great time to stock up on some of your Kelnero favorites, or at least other people's Kelnero favorites, because there's only 12 days before the 12 13th. 12 days of Kelnero and yeah. the drink. Basically Christmas. Anyway, so we're going to do that for the first two weeks, and then we might try to squeeze in one more tasting in February. Um, and we're not sure what it's going to be, but then there will be lots more tastings after that. We'll keep doing this. Yeah. So that's upcoming events. Then it's March. And, I, and we think kind of tossing around for February, we might do a tequila tasting because we haven't done one of those. Uh, and then I, there was, I don't know the other one. I think tequila was the only one we kind of set on. Uh, tequila, uh, Uncle Nearest was another contender. Well, that's just. Fun. Are you gonna Are you gonna uh, include the mezcal in the tequila? Negative. So we did a mezcal, and then tequila we would keep. Uh, Separate. Just tequila, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, cool. I still kind of want to do a brandy one. We did the brandy happy hour the other day, and I think that people were like a little surprised by it. Um, by how awesome it was. Yeah, we did. Uh, so we could do a more full. I love the Armagnac. God damn. Um, yeah. Stuff is so good. Fucking delicious. That's a good one, yeah. Um, we also, uh, we talked about cachaça. Some people are interested in cachaça. Um, Which is a very intense, that would be a very intense tasting. <laughs> so, but it would be awesome. Yeah. Oh, they've got some that are mellower than others, especially these days. What, what is it? I don't even know what that is. It's like rum. It's like rum, but it's oh. Brazilian. It's more like those, usually it's more like kind of funky high ester rums. So a lot of cachaças are a little intense if you're new to cachaça, but um, you can find some cool ones, really yeah. cool ones. And some are like relatively easy going. Um, but there's a lot. Some of our favorites come from a woman-owned distillery in Brazil, which is just Abua. not something you find every day. Um, yeah. Oh, Amaro. Yeah, aperitifs. So Amari is one that I've wanted to do for a while. Um, yeah, Amaro would really, be cool. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, we could really line you up. We could do like palate busters. We could really bust your palate because they tend to be less expensive and less high proof. Um, so before we get too much into that, so we'll do more tastings. We'll keep them going. I see you, Cheryl, with your membership idea. It's not a bad idea. Um, but uh, if you do have any questions about Buffalo Trace, we do have our resident expert here with us. So feel free to grill him um, or us. We'll do our best about if you had any other questions about bourbon or Buffalo Trace or Sazerac, maybe you're curious about what else they do or anything like that, feel free to just chime in and ask. Or how you can get a bottle, ask him, ask that guy, <laughs> yeah. ask Josiah. He did get you those sweet <laughs> uh, notebooks. So we got that going for us. Yeah, yeah, the notebook, the coaster and the Glen Karen's all from this gentleman. So thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. It was very nice to okay, get Okay, Josiah, where can I get the special reserve? <laughs> uh... <laughs> The, honestly, um, Chris's answer is is a great one for that. Uh, become friends with your liquor store owners um, and find ones that uh, don't charge an arm and a leg for it because it shouldn't be an arm and a leg. Um, the special reserve, it's the green label, right? Correct. Uh, is the most common to find. Um, so you'll probably see it around. Um, you might even be able to get lucky and find it in a total wine um, because the, the quantity is is enough to make it in there but it is a, a very special bottle um and uh I, i'm happy that you have it and happy, happy you like it well i i i i have it because a friend a very close friend of mine works at total wine oh yeah <laughs> there you go. Good friend to have <laughs> and, uh, that was my birthday present <laughs> awesome well so, and if you ask nice maybe josiah will allocate what bottle justin will say bob on it that's not up to me it's not up to me <laughs> Uh, Josiah, we had another question in the chat asking about the origin of the name Buffalo Trace. Totally. Um, so uh, Buffalo Trace is a uh, reference to migration patterns um, that are worn into the prairie back when the, the buffaloes uh, roamed free. Um, they would basically follow these set paths 
uh, throughout these expansive prairies uh, to find resources to help them live. Um, and uh, the reason why Buffalo Trace, both the distillery and the bourbon are named that because allegedly, um, and this is allegedly as, as Callie went into, a, a lot of bourbon history is shrouded in mystery and legends and lore. Um, allegedly the first person who settled on the spot where Buffalo Trace Distillery is, is to this day, and they have a house um, from the 1800s um, that is attributed to him. His name is uh, Hancock Lee. Um, and allegedly he followed one of those Buffalo Traces to the edge of the uh, Kentucky River for, um, um, for water, which he would then eventually start doing distillation because at that point, um, if you could prove that you were growing and distilling your crop, uh, you would be gifted a certain uh, amount of land, basically from the U.S. government, because they felt like they owned that. Awesome. There you have it. So it's where the buffalo realm roamed a lot. Past tense. So wait a minute, does that imply that Kentucky's in the West? I mean, it's west of east. <laughs> Good answer. It's hard, hard to argue that logic. It depends on when you were drawing the maps, I guess. Any other questions? Any other... Uh, or inappropriate yeah. dick jokes. Always appropriate time for oh, that. Easy time on the dick jokes. Gosh. Hey, you guys remember that one time that Chris just typed boobs into the chat and none of us understood the context? Yeah, you were there. Some of you were there <laughs> and it made sense. Yeah, we, we, we were there. Chris has, been trying, Chris has been trying to get me to type that all night. <laughs> <laughs> She's been te texting you endlessly. Type boobs, do it. Somebody's got to. Where's that Veronica Vaughn. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, I just, oh, fuck. I don't know what else. I will say um, that long term, there's two long term things that we're working on. First of all, we're going to do a tasting like this. Um, and we're still figuring it out because it's going to take a few years to get there. But each year we get our allocations of like Pappy Van Winkles and Antique. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, dick joke. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, we're going to do a tasting eventually of, um, of, of Pappy. Um, and here's the real fucking trick is that those bottles aren't worth a lot. Like that, like money, like dollars, you know, like, like the, the price, the, not the value. The money that we pay for them is not worth what we could sell them for we could sell them and go to Hawaii for a week. Um, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to sell them and then we're going to put them into a tasting. And then that tasting will be, uh, presented to whoever, you know, is on our email list first. So if you're on our email list, you'll know about that. You might have to be on our email list for like three years or four or five. I don't fucking know. But if you're on there, I keep you'll know that. first. Um, and that's just going to be something fun. I mean, I, it'll just be interesting, you know? Um, and then if you ever read like, um, uh, like best whiskeys of the year and, uh, pay attention to those things, like not last year, but two years ago, two years ago, two of the antique collections were top, they were rated the top whiskeys in the world. Um, and they're just hard to get a hold of, but you know, those are the kind of things that we're holding on to. So I'm not saying we have those whiskeys, we might, but we might not. Um, but you know, those, that's something we want to build into a tasting and something that like, it's just hard to put it on a shelf and price it too high. And then nobody buys it. That's fucking frustrating. And so if we can do it in a tasting where all of you get to taste it, it'll be fun. Uh, we probably will only sell like 23 of those so that we can drink uh two of them let's be real uh because we're not gonna hold on to that shit for fucking five years and not drink any of it god damn that's fucked up spillage 
<laughs> but also that gives you the context. Like you don't want, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of people that they're, I don't know, looking to burn money or somebody's trying to impress them. They go to a bar, they try something like Pappy Van Winkle. They don't know what it is. They don't know how to appreciate it. They're not drinking it in context. They can say they've tried it. Do they really remember it? Honestly, most people won't have a great memory of what that flavor is um, without somebody like kind of talking to them about it while they're drinking it. Um, so I think a lot of people that have tried it, unless they're serious bourbon hunters are kind of missing out, on it. but we don't want that to happen to you. We always want to give you this like sort of excessively long presentation associated with all of our tastings. Um, so that is our goal. And yes, all the people that supported us along the way, we won't forget you. We could probably sell that fucking tasting for several grand to people all over the world, but that wouldn't be any fun now. But we it? shan't because fuck the other people of the world. Uh, and then uh, also side notes, because um, I always, again, when we're talking about like rare bottles, bottles that you can buy from us, uh, E.H. Taylor and the, uh, the small batch and the Eagle Rare, uh, and you have your 10% off uh, little coupon there with your, your uh, uh, internet entry or whatever. The other ones, uh, not attainable. If you want a Blanton's, uh, you can leave a note and then, you know, if we get them in, we'll call people in order um, or you know, not with the other bottles. That doesn't apply. But with the Blantons, it kind of applies. We try to um, at least keep Blantons in stock at the bar so you could come down and have a shot of it. Yeah. Um, I think that was about all I had to say for that. Yeah. For that, yeah. All right. Well, we're. I, I didn't have a question, but I had a statement because I was catching up on chat, which is like way at the under and other end of the table, and I'm really nearsighted. Um, Josiah, if there is another unicorn that you have not tasted, I'm Callie's older sister. Hi, I'm Violet. If I've paid for the tasting, I will split it with you so you can taste the unicorn. That's a deal. That's, that's that. very generous. I really appreciate that. Uh, weirdly enough, I think Weller Single Barrel might be the only whiskey from the Buffalo Trace line that I have not tasted at this point. Wow. Uh, that's not including like some of the like, eh, like old school E.H. Taylors that no one has anywhere. But anything that they currently produce, I think I've, I think at this point I can say that I've tasted all of them. But that's, I really appreciate that. That's, 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 that's a very generous gesture. Um, but keep them for yourself. Essentially, he said he doesn't have any unicorn barrels or <laughs> bottles for us. He also <laughs> said that if you want to find that unicorn barrel and taste it, you just need to go work for the company that makes it. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Was a it was a driving factor for the job. <laughs> well, we have the single barrel. We have that much left, but I'm going to go put it on that shelf back there which is my shit that i couldn't taste because i'm fucking pregnant and i'm saving it for july and that's where this is going <laughs> right next to that uh the octomores <laughs> she, while she's wasted drinking whiskey she waited a year to drink i'm gonna have one of those like boob things that i put on like yeah. a backpack and i'm gonna Pump take care up. of the baby for a day <laughs> mommy's sleeping it's gonna be good it's gonna be an awesome august friends <laughs> yeah Alrighty. Well, any other questions before we all sign off tonight? No, congratulations, guys. On your Thank it's a you wonderful, so much. wonderful, wonderful time. Yes. You're gonna love it. You're gonna absolutely love it. Thanks. That's good to hear. I have swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> swimmers in a big cock. <laughs> like the amount of grimaces <laughs> on the screen right there was amazing. It was like it was like grimace, 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 and grimace. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining. <laughs> it's a pleasure sharing Ew. our happy news with people like you that are here for us. You show up for us. You support us. Uh, we love you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Good Bye. night, guys. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>